I've been told there are two types of people uh, that walk into a room. One that walks into a room and essentially says, here I am. Right? Do you know those kind of people like, I'm here. Uh, and the, the second type of person walks into a room and says, there you are. Have you ever heard that? Two types of people, here I am, there you are. So I know like as Christians or the way we try to raise our kids, we want to raise there you are people. But the truth is like I can be a here I am guy at certain things. You start yapping about yourself and you've been at that party or that gathering where someone's just like, I've done this and I've done this and I can do this. I'm really good at this. I've done this. Here's my resume, right? And you're like, oh. And then what do we say about that person? Eventually, we don't say it to their face. We say, honey, that guy. You know, he was egotistical, right? Or he's a narcissist. Or uh, that um, I heard a story about like someone who looks in a pond and sees their reflection and then falls into the pond because they love the reflection so much. I mean, it's kind of that idea that we like love ourselves so much. And we go on and on and on about ourselves. And usually that person is labeled uh, an egomaniac. Here's a little bit of a rub, though. God says these same things all through scripture. God says, I am this, I am, I am, I am. I can do this, I can do that. So in this series of these I am statements that are found in the gospel of John, there's seven of them where where Jesus is saying, I'm this, I can do this, I'm this, I can do this, I'm this, I can do this. So here's my question. Um, Does God have an ego? I, I have friends who are not Christians and they would say, Nate, the God you worship is a narcissist, Right? He's all about himself. And you start to think about it, okay. And so he's kind of like Muhammad Ali, right? I put this, uh, I had a picture in there, that's not it, um, of, of Muhammad Ali. You know, Muhammad Ali is like, oh, I am the greatest of all time. And some people say that's what God is like. If you go back to that slide, I'm sorry, I skipped it, the one before, my fault. These are these statements that Jesus says about himself in John that we're going to go through. I'm the bread of life, that's tonight. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door uh, for the sheep or of the sheep, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the true vine, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and I'm the resurrection and the life. But if any human were to say some of these things, I think people would be like, who do you think you are? But God is saying these things, and some people have said that the God of Christianity is uh, kind of egocentric. He even says, worship me, right? If you had a friend that said, hey, Nate, worship me, you'd be like, what is your problem? And some people have our time, but God would say, worship me. So if you're going to say, okay, I don't think he's an egomaniac, but here's my question. Why does Jesus make these seven statements about who he is and essentially uh, what he can do? That's what we're going to explore all the way through Easter. Let me give you a little bit of backstory because I think it's important. If you go, and you don't have to, but if you go to Exodus, in the second book, Exodus 3, you see this great story. And it's the story of Moses and the burning bush. And and Moses is hearing from God, and they're talking, and then Moses has this great question. He says, what's your name? Hey, voice, what's your name? So why does Moses say, what is your name? Well, in Egyptian culture, it's a polytheistic culture. There's a whole bunch of gods. So essentially, he's saying this really cool thing's happening. When I go back, I got to tell him which one of the thousands of gods just showed up and spoke to me through a burning bush. And so that's why he's saying, what's your name? And so what does God say his name is? He says, I am that I am. Essentially, it translates, I am that I am. Now, I personally think it would have been easier if you just said Gerald or just like, just a name, just like, shh. But what does that mean? I am that I am. I'm sure Moses was like, huh? I am that I am. And so what God is saying, and this is the basis for this whole series that goes from the Old Testament to the New Testament, what God is saying is, I'm the one you've been longing for. I'm the one you've been hoping for. I am the answer to the issues you have. I am the God among gods. I am, I am. And he was trying to get Moses to understand that. Okay, fast forward a second. We're going to spend this whole series in the Gospel of John. John is probably my favorite of the four Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're all different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a ton of similarities. John is different. People call John the artist, the poet. Uh, He just says things differently and and, in ways that don't show up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this is one of them. He has some unique statements, and these I am statements do not show up in uh, any other Matthew, Mark, and Luke, only in John. And here's what he's doing as an artist. This statement was said to Moses, here's my name, I am. And look what John does. 
he paints in that picture of who God is with these seven statements. Yes, you are I am, and you're also the bread of life. You're the good shepherd, right? And he paints all these things. And that's what we're going to be looking at, this thing, this gift that John paints for us. Now, all seven of these are not just cool images. They're deep theological truths. They're deep theological truths. To miss them, you're missing something big about God. To get them, you're getting something big about God. So John giving us these seven I am statements are deeply helpful to us. And and the last thing I think I'll say is uh, Catherine Shiraka, she's not here tonight. I asked her to paint this for me. And, And one of the ideas behind it, as we look at these I am statements, and she was explaining her art. I'm not an artist. I don't get any of this. But, um, She's like in the middle of, is kind of calm and clear. This is who God is, as if it's in the middle of kind of chaos. And she tried to kind of paint chaos around it. The truth is when God said, I am that I am in the Old Testament and through the Gospel of John, all these I am statements, he's speaking truth in the midst of chaos. People are thinking, who am I? Who is God? And God keeps saying, here's who I am. Here's who I am. Okay, you tracking with me as our kind of intro to this whole series? So now, context to this, I am the bread of, the li- uh, bread of life, John 6, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Um, the context will really help you. In John 6, there's the feeding of the 5,000. Five loaves, two scrawny fish, and Jesus makes a meal for 5,000 people. Now, the disciples just saw this, so pause for a second. Don't just, if you've been a Christian a long time, you hear stuff, you're like, yeah, we know that story. Think about it. It's a miracle. It it points to God's provision for his people. The disciples just saw this. That some young guy showed up with five loaves and two scrawny fish, and Jesus says, I'm going to make it a meal and provide for everyone, okay? Imagine if you got to see that. So they got to see this, and here's where we pick up in verse 30. And you got to wrap your head around uh, now what they're saying to Jesus after they just witnessed this miracle. So they asked him, this should be humorous, by the way, so. They asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Do you get why that's funny? They just saw five loaves and two fish feed 5,000 people. They're like, hey, do you think you could do something to prove to us maybe you're God and not just human? I'm sure Jesus is like, oh, my gosh. I thought it was funny. Verse 31, Christian humor, people. Okay, verse 31. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and as is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So what they're saying is, hey, you know the Old Testament story where God gave them bread from the sky? Like, do you think you could do that for us? That was cool. And Jesus uh, starts to answer them. So do you get what's happening? They saw this miracle, and they say, we kind of want something like Moses got, maybe. I mean, the fish and the loaves were great, but maybe we get something else. And Jesus says in verse 32, Verily, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Okay, so they came asking for regular bread, and he tells them about different bread. They're like, yeah, give us that. And then verse 35, then Jesus declared, and here's we get this first statement. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Here's this claim. Jesus is claiming, I am the bread of life. And I want to unpack that for a second. Bread of life. Uh, When you think of bread, we'll uncover that. When you think of bread, you know, you think you have to eat to live, right? You think sustenance. You might think carbs. Carbs give us fuel. 
And so all these images where Jesus says, I am the bread of life, but think for a second. second. You've heard this maybe before, but to hear it for the first time, you go to the person you think is the Messiah and they tell you they're bread. It's a little bit of an odd statement. Like we come here looking for bread, you know, the kind you put in your mouth and you're saying your bread. Okay? And they're trying to hear, they're trying to hear him out what he's saying. And, and the point I wanted to go to first is not the bread part as much as the life part. He says, I am the bread of life. What kind of life is Jesus talking about? Well, if you look in the New Testament, there are two main words for life, bios and zoe. So we name our kids Zoe. We usually don't name kids Bios. Um, maybe, but there is a Zoe here right there. So Bios, physical life, that shows up a lot in the New Testament. Zoe is eternal or everlasting life. And so these are the two that show up often uh, in John, and he uses both of them, I would say, frequently. But the way I'll use them and the way it sometimes come across in Scripture is Bios, that kind of life, is existing. But when he talks about zoe, he's talking about living. So there's, yes, God gives us bios, right? Gives us physical life, and we're grateful for that. But it's not just that. He goes on to talk about life as zoe, as like eternal life. So for instance, in John 10.10, one of my favorite top five verses, that Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly or to the full. So what kind of life is that? Jesus came so that we might have bios and have just a normal existence, right? No, it's not bios. It's Jesus came, didn't so we just, not so we would just skate along and do this life and end up with a good retirement account. He came that we might have zoe, eternal life, centered and given from God and have it abundantly, not stingy, like big. That's what John is saying, and he's trying to, uh, Jesus is trying to help people understand Zoe life and not just Bios life. The physical is only one part, so the Bios is only one part of our life, and, and we're grateful for it, but it's temporal. Like we talked about that at Ash Wednesday. We love this life, but we're born and then we die. It's temporal, and Jesus is trying to get them to wake up a little bit and quit thinking just about temporal things and think about eternal things just for a second. And so here's a question I think we have to ask ourselves, even if we've been a Christian a long time. Is Jesus Christ the bios or is Jesus Christ the zoe, like the bread of bios or the bread of zoe? Do you get me? Is he just physical bread? Or is he the everlasting, eternal bread for us? So pause on that for a second. Because if you think of all seven statements, they're not just theological truths, but they're also invitations. So catch this part of what he's saying in John 6. It's this great invitation to Zoe. Meaning, don't just live physically. Live spiritually. It's the way I wired you abundantly. And so he's saying, I invite you into this Zoe kind of life where you'll never be hungry or thirsty. That's the invitation, okay? So the invitation tonight for Jesus is this kind of bread, you will never be hungry or thirsty. This kind of bread that he's talking about doesn't mold, it doesn't run out, and you don't have to buy it. That's a great kind of bread. The kind of bread Jesus is talking about, he said, I'm the bread. I don't mold, like I don't spoil. I'm abundant. There's a lot and you don't have to buy it. That's what he's saying about this bread that's different than any other bread they've ever heard of. Do you get the invitation that Jesus is asking? Here's the way I see it. I know I love food, but it's this spiritual buffet, and and, and God has this massive buffet where he's saying, come eat, all of you, right? Got a shady past? Come eat. Doesn't matter. Come eat, come eat, come eat, come eat. There's plenty for you to eat. I'm not going to run out of food. That's this great image, I think, that God's telling us through this statement of, I'm the bread of life. And each one of these that we go through this week uh, reveals something about the I am that we see uh, in, in Exodus. So when he says, I am the bread of life, here's what I hear. He's saying, I'm a generous God. I'm not a stingy God. 
I think some of us struggle, like some of us are generous because we understand a generous God, but some of us act stingy, not just with our money, but with our love, with our time. Because at the end of the day, I think we might think God's a little stingy. But when you believe God is generous, and this is a generous statement, I'm the bread of life, come eat all of you as much as you want, come. That's a great picture of a very generous God. But as you read on in verse 36, something Jesus addresses. So he gives this great invitation, but he says something. Here's what he says. And this is a great message for a lot of us as Christians. He says, you see, but you don't believe. And so I guess what I mean is some of us come in churches. We've been in churches a long time. We see, we hear, but maybe we don't really believe that he is the bread of life, that he is the Christ, that he is the Lord and Messiah. And so he's saying, you all have seen a lot, disciples. And some of you don't even believe. So here's my question. What keeps us from trusting or believing that God will provide everything and does provide everything? What what keeps us from believing that Jesus really is enough? So I started thinking about that because I think we have to answer that. What keeps us from thinking that God will provide everything? Here's some of the things I wrote down. I think some of us think it's easier to to provide for ourselves than to trust, right? We think it's easier just to kind of do all these things and work real hard and try to provide uh, not just physical things, but emotional things for everyone that we love because we don't want to trust that God actually can do it, right? And so it's a little bit of a control issue I think sometimes we have. is like, I know he's God, but I do it faster and I kind of like the way I do it, right? And so we try to control these outcomes with our loved ones and with our friends. The other one is, Um, I think we get so focused on our work and providing and working and doing that we quit looking up. I saw this picture um, that one of my friends posted, and I thought it was funny. Look at it for a second. There's this gorgeous sunset, like really pretty. And there's a guy with his little headphones on and his uh, little treasure finder thingy uh, looking down and as if he's not even paying attention to what's happening. And you can see another guy over there by the seagulls just looking out at the sun going, oh my gosh. And I think what I love about this picture is, you know, that is us sometimes. We have our headphones on and we're going around with our little, tr- our little treasure finder, our little metal detector going, ding, oh, bottle cap, that's cool, you know. And, and we kind of miss the bigger treasure because we're so busy looking at some of these little treasures. Do you ever feel that way? Like we just kind of miss the bigger thing because we're doing, ding, and we find these little things and not settling for the biggest. The other one I think that keeps us sometimes from trusting is we get, um, we get too full in our lives of the good things that we don't leave room for the great. Do you know what I mean by that? Like I would say a lot of people uh, in, in our church or people I know here don't wake up and say, I'm going to do evil things against God today. Like most people don't say that. But here's what we do. We chalk our lives and our thought lives full of, of decent things where there's no room for the greatest thing for God. And so we stay real busy. And then our culture, we're like, man, they're awesome. They're so busy. They do so many things, right? We, we praise one another for it. But it's almost like we don't leave room for, for that, which is the greatest. And I'm guilty of that. Um, I'll give you an example. Wednesday night after Ash Wednesday, it was a beautiful service, I thought. It was a powerful service, but I was really hungry. Some people fast food during Lent. I didn't fast. I'm fasting other things, but not food, so I I went to eat, and my family went home, and so I went to this restaurant I've never been before. I won't mention it, but um, I ate so much food that I don't normally eat, a, a, a cultural food that I don't normally eat, and I just started ordering things. It was just me at the table and plates everywhere. I was loving it for a while. Um... That next day, I was miserable. I mean, my stomach, it was just like, I, I was like, oh, no, what happened? And so I was like, they poisoned me, right? <laughs> food poisoning. And then I had this realization, yes, it could be food poisoning. It's probably not. It's probably the fact that I ate a whole bunch of stuff I didn't really need, right? Like a whole bunch of spicy stuff and cabbage stuff and all this stuff. And, like, and I just, it was good, but it wasn't great. And so, you know, when you're sick at your stomach, you can't do anything else. Like, you can't pay attention to anything else. So that's kind of what happens to us. And just so you know, my wife wasn't very compassionate during this sickness because it's one of those, well, you shouldn't eat that. But that's the truth of, of what we sometimes do is we get so full on things that we have a hard time paying attention to that which is the most important because we're so full on, on good things and not the greatest thing. 
We have, um, in each one of us, I believe this, we have a Zoe need. We have an eternal need inside us. And I think we address that need sometimes with a bios solution. We have eternal needs inside of us, and I think we try to address those things with physical things, and it doesn't work. Like the disciples, when they came to Jesus, what were they concerned with? Their stomachs, like bread. And Jesus is saying, not that he doesn't care about our stomachs and and our, our food, but he's saying, I care about your hearts. I care about eternity, not just where you're gonna get this next meal at this moment. I care about something bigger. And it's almost like the disciples couldn't understand that. Another thing I thought of, which I think this one's a little bit interesting and I struggle with it too, but sometimes we get so enamored with the provisions of God. So think of what God provides. Jobs, family, friends, finances, all kinds of stuff that God provides. The outdoors, nature, beauty, all these things. We get so enamored with the provisions of God that we lose sight of the provider of the provisions. Do you get what I'm saying? Like God gives us things like, this is so great, this is so great. We almost forget that these are things that come from God. We get too enamored with them that, that we, we no longer see God. Um, I remember uh, joking with one of my coworkers at my last church of saying that all the little kids at my last church loved me. And uh, I was bragging about it, like, man, they all love me. And he said, do you know why they love you, Nate? I'm like, why? Tell me, because I'm so great. And uh, he said, no, because you always give them animal crackers. <laughs> I was like, oh. He's like, you notice when you don't have animal crackers, they don't really love you? And I was like, that's so true, <laughs> right? <laughs> Kids love me because I have snacks. And when I don't have snacks, they're like, oh, I don't know who that guy is. I'm like, oh. think about that. God gives us and provides us things like we love it when God provides things, um, but sometimes we don't see God because of the provisions, like, oh, we, our family's healthy and all these things, and then that's what we pay attention to, and we lose sight of God. It's like God gives us treats, and, and we can't see God past that. And, and, and the, the truth is that God gives us these things, these provisions in his life, so that we do see him, not that we're distracted by them. I've been thinking about that a lot this week. But in all these things where he's saying, you all don't see this, right? You see me, but you don't believe. And that seeing isn't always believing is what Jesus is saying. But I want you all to hear this too. I've had this conversation with Eric several times, and it's really true. If you look at all of Scripture, God will never force us or coerce us to love him. God will never force us or coerce us to love him. In scripture, he never forces people to do anything. This is what I love about God. He says, hey, here's the food, come and eat. It's for all, come and eat. He rings the bell and wants people to come, but doesn't make people come and eat. I love that about God. And he keeps revealing, saying, hey, here's the buffet. He keeps revealing who he is. He keeps saying, here's who I am. But he will never force people to love him and never force people to serve him. I hope we remember that. Here's what Jesus is claiming in this I am statement. Look at verse 40. I'm going to read it real quick, put it on the screen. He said, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up the last day. What a great promise. That's what he's saying. Everyone who looks to him and believes will be raised up, will be saved. He's saying, um, I haven't come just to bring bread. I have come to be bread. I haven't come to just like improve your life, polish up your life. I've come to be life is what Jesus is saying. So let's go back to the very beginning. Is God an egomaniac? Is, as we understand these statements about himself, is God egocentric? Uh, is he a narcissist? Uh, these kind of accusations about God. I would actually say this. The opposite of an egoist is an altruist or altruism, a word that if, if used in like um, zoological terms, they would say uh, it's the animal that benefits someone else to its own sacrifice, right? At the animal that helps the other animal, but it hurts them to help them. As I think about that, that's Christ. That's what Christ did uh, for the benefit of the world to his own sacrifice. 
That's what Jesus did. The opposite, I would say, of being uh, an egomaniac. Because the truth is, narcissists, uh, they don't die for the sake of other people. Narcissists don't sacrifice for the sake of other people. God did. And the greatest provision God gives as we think about I'm the bread of life and all this provision, the greatest provision of all things God has given you is Jesus Christ. And he's saying, this is all you need. He is all you need. But here's kind of the rub for me. Is Jesus really enough? We say that a lot. And we go, oh yeah, he is. But is Jesus really enough? And I think we have to say that a lot in this world of when relationships fall apart, when health falls apart, when our children don't do like we thought they should do, all these things, when the stock market goes the other way, when our president, this president or that president does something we don't like, when, when life doesn't go as you think it should go, is Jesus still enough? And I think that's the real question. When there's real darkness in our world and we feel like there's little hope, but is Jesus still enough in the midst of that? I think that's a question we have to answer. Tonight, as we celebrate communion, this is where I want us to direct our attention as I close. I believe this, that Jesus is all we've ever needed, Jesus is all we need today, and Jesus is all we will ever need. And so we celebrate communion to keep ourselves focusing on the greatest provision of all time. That tonight we celebrate, because of Christ's death and resurrection, we can have Zoe life, and not just bios, not just existing but have an abundant life through Jesus Christ. This word in Scripture, Eucharisto, you've heard people call this the Eucharist. It means, I will give thanks. Tonight, because of this statement, I am the bread of life, I think we have a lot to be thankful for. Tonight, as we come forward, we are thankful that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. We're thankful that all who come to him will never be hungry and never be thirsty. Every provision met in him. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, if any of those words were just me rambling, I pray that they would be, kind of be moved to the side, but that your scripture, your truth, would be heard tonight for all of us. And that the great sermon always is not what I just did, but what it's communion. It's the, the bread and the blood. It's the sacrifice you made for the cosmos, for the world, that we might have abundant life. And you have a, a big offer to all people. We want to be thankful for that this night, that you are the bread of life. And God, we've tried to, um, we're insatiable in so many ways. And we've tried to fill our needs with health and wealth and all these other things. But to know that our deepest hunger and our deepest thirst will be met in you, Lord Jesus. And you say that to us in John 6, and we're grateful for that message. God, I pray that these ordinary things, bread and juice, will point to an extraordinary love found only in you, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen.